All right. I think that's it. Our, uh, let's get to our first keynote for today. And I apologize for the notes. I, I usually try to do this off the top of my head, but I have a, a lengthy bit of introduction here, so I want to make sure I don't miss any of it. Uh, our, our guest speaker, our keynote speaker, has been an emerging technology strategist for more than 30 years, helping others understand the strategic implications of this emerging tech. Uh, he's the author, author of three books, numerous blog posts, white papers. He's delivered more than 1,000 keynote addresses and executive presentations in more than 25 countries over the years. Uh, he was also voted one of the world's top 25 professional speakers by more than 27,000 meeting planners, executives, and conference attendees. Okay, our guests, his clients include Mercedes-Benz, GE, Coca-Cola, Johnson & Johnson, IBM, SAP, Oracle, the impressive list goes on, hundreds of other businesses and public sector organizations, both large and small. Widely regarded as an authority and an expert on breakthrough technology such as artificial intelligence, blockchain technology, uh, 3D printing, Internet of Things. Our guest also serves as executive director of the American Blockchain Council and graduated from Yale and got his MBA from Kellogg. He's lived in Atlanta for 30 years, has three children, four grandchildren, enjoys fine dining, good wine, and the exercise required to work that all off. I agree with you on two of those three things. I hate the exercise part. Uh, just on a personal note, I've gotten to know our, our guest speaker over the past three months or so as we talked a lot on the phone about this presentation. Um, not only is he a consummate professional, but he is also has some very keen insight into uh, these advancements in these emerging techs and how some of the world's leading companies are applying them practically today. So I think you're going to find his, uh, his information very educational and, uh, and informative. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage our keynote speaker, Jack Shaw. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, it's exciting to be here in New Orleans, uh, especially right at the opening of the French Quarter Festival this weekend. And I want to thank all of you who are here uh, for staying at least until 9 a.m. before you go out and start partying again. Uh, you could tell last night in the quarter, things were already ramping up. People were getting very excited, getting in that New Orleans party mood. And uh, in fact, I went out very early this morning, about 5 a.m., to take a walk and grab a Starbucks and uh, um, uh, right, the one right at the edge of the French Quarter. And Scott, was that you I saw coming back from the French Quarter at 5 a.m.? No, no, okay, you've got a doppelganger out there. That's okay. So um, I enjoy the opportunity to be here with you and uh, have been looking forward to having the opportunity to speak with you this morning. This is the Queen Elizabeth. The QE1, to be specific, for those of you that keep track, and for 50 years in the first half of the 20th century, she and her sister ocean liners dominated the market for transatlantic passenger transportation. If you were a business person and wanted to travel from, say, New York to London, you went by ship. Now, by the late 1930s, it had become possible to fly commercially across the ocean. But as any of the executives of the ocean liner companies would have told you at the time and subsequently, what self-respecting business person would ever want to subject themselves to 18 to 30 hours of cramped, cold, vibrating, noisy discomfort when instead of flying, traveling by ship, you could ride in comfort, indeed in luxury, and get to your destination in less than a week? And uh, so it was. Until August of 1957, when Pan American Airlines introduced Boeing 707 nonstop jet service from New York to London in eight hours. And in six months, the transatlantic passenger transportation business lost 90% of its customers. Disruptive technologies can have a profound and lasting impact on industry and businesses of all kinds. We're going to talk a little bit about some disruptive technologies this morning and how they're likely to impact e-commerce and business in general, and for that matter, society, over the course of the next few years. 
At the same time, having been a technology strategist for some decades now, I've learned uh, to heed the wisdom of that great American philosopher, Yogi Berra, who put it so well when he said, making predictions is very hard, especially about the future. <laughs> and I'm the first to admit that my predictions are not always well received. About 20 years ago, I was speaking to a group of manufacturers about this emerging technology called the World Wide Web. And I was actually presenting with a computer hooked up to the internet. Uh, and I was uh, explaining to them that they were looking at something that was called a website. And they were all website. Um, and I said, well, this particular website happens to be one developed by a little startup company. You'll have never heard of them. They go by the strange name of Amazon.com. And uh, so I went onto the website. I ordered a copy of my most recent book and had it shipped to the president of this particular trade association I was speaking to. And at the end of the demonstration, I said, so what do you think? Now, this is a room full of senior level executives of mid-sized to large corporations, not a dummy in the room. One guy raises his hand. Yes. Um, he said, Jack, fascinating stuff. Wow, who knew you could do this kind of thing? Very cool, but may I ask you a question? I said, of course. He said, well, what has this got to do with us? We're manufacturers. We don't sell books. Pew. Um, a few months later, I was speaking to a technology conference, a group of uh, you know, high-tech experts. And I was describing this emerging business practice of e-commerce and painting what I call a near future scenario, what life was going to be like just a few years in the future, as you'll see in a few minutes. And at the end of the presentation, a fellow came up to me and grabbed me by my sleeve and said, Jack, he said, I'm very excited. I love your optimism and enthusiasm about the future. But you obviously don't understand technology very well. And I said, well, I love your diplomacy. No, I actually didn't say that. But I said, well, please, by all means, enlighten me. And he said, well, he said, we don't really have the uh, processing power. We may never have the bandwidth. And we're certainly never going to have the security that would be needed uh, so this notion you're trying to peddling that someday people are going to be uh, using their computers to do their banking electronically online, it'll never happen. It just can't be done. And he was absolutely right. At that point in time, it could not be done. It was a good, oh, 18 months before the big <laughs> banks started rolling out online electronic banking at that point. So some people may choose to uh, disbelieve or be skeptical about predictions because they think it just doesn't apply to their business. Others may think it's not technically possible because it doesn't, it's not already happening today. And, uh, but let me ask you to suspend your disbelief because nevertheless, I'm going to go out on a limb this morning and share a couple of examples with you of um, how I think electronic commerce is going to be functioning in the near future. We're going to take a look at a B2B example and a B2C example. So in our first scenario, the latest generation of passenger jet pauses for a moment at the end of the runway at Charles de Gaulle International Airport in Paris before being cleared for takeoff on a nonstop flight to Louis Armstrong, New Orleans International Airport. Several hours later, far out over the North Atlantic, a sensor embedded in one of its engines, jet fuel injectors, detects that that fuel injector has reached a critical point of wear. It'll continue to function properly for the rest of the flight, but for safety purposes, will have to be replaced before the return flight to Paris that evening. Now, in the old days, like say 2019, that would have meant taking the aircraft out of service for hours or days if necessary. That's a very expensive part, rarely needs replacement, and isn't kept in stock at the New Orleans airport. So what do they do? Well, in the near future, what will happen that's different is that the Internet of Things sensors embedded in that fuel injector 
will inform the aircraft's maintenance system that that part will need to be replaced. That information in turn is automatically shared with the aircraft's global maintenance system, which schedules a replacement of that part, schedules an engineer to be available, and notifies the procurement system that that part is going to be needed at that gate on arrival. The procurement system launches an intelligent procurement agent onto the internet, searching thousands of sites of both current and potential new suppliers of that particular part certified for use with that engine on that particular aircraft. It identifies a number of those and automatically negotiates pricing, terms, and conditions and selects the one that offers the best terms and conditions for the airline and executes a, a legally enforceable online smart contract for the purchase of that part. At the conclusion of which, the airline is then authorized to download the design of that part to a 3D printer located at Louis Armstrong International Airport. The part is printed out waiting at the gate along with the engineer. When the plane arrives, as the passengers are disembarking, it's being serviced and refueled. Otherwise, new passengers are getting on board. The engineer replaces the old part with the new part, and the aircraft takes off without a single minute's delay and with a brand new jet fuel injector in place to ensure many more safe and reliable international round trips. In our second scenario, Luke and Annie are very excited. They're planning a dinner party this weekend for three other couples who are close friends. But first, they have to plan the menu and select the prepared foods and ingredients they'd like to use. Fortunately, they live right down the street from a brand new branch of one of the most exciting retail destinations around, Le Eat. Le Eat is a modern food hall, a combination grocery, specialty food emporium, and self-serve restaurant. Luke and Annie think they'll find what they need and perhaps get a few new ideas while they're there. When they walk into La Eat, a picture of Annie's face flashes up on her smartphone and a La Eat robo host speaking to her through her smartphone says, welcome back to La Eat, Annie. Would you like to shop with us here today? When Annie says yes, the robo host says, will it be okay to use your standard payment method if you find something like you like? And again, Annie says yes. Laite's robo host asks Annie if she has a shopping list she'd like to share. When she does so, the robo host shares a map of the store, showing her the most convenient route to find each of the items she has listed. It then tells her that it appears from the items she has listed that she's planning to make a chocolate ganache cake and asks if that's correct. When she says yes, it lists several other items not on her list and asks if she might also need any of these other ingredients typically used in making a chocolate ganache cake. When she realizes she's out of baking powder, she asks the robo host to add it to her list. The robo host then mentions that the pastry shop has several kinds and sizes of prepared chocolate ganache cakes ready made and asks if they'd like to see them before buying the ingredients. They decide that's a good idea, so they review the selections and taste a bite offered by the human hostess at the bakery. They decide it's so good, they'll save the time and have a freshly baked cake delivered to their place the morning of the party. The robo-host then asks if they'd like the items needed exclusively for making their own cake removed from the shopping list, and Annie agrees. Next, they go to the butcher shop to pick out a few pounds of flank steak for the main course. They've learned that they particularly like Argentinian grass-fed beef from the Mendoza Valley, also famed for its wines. They ask the butcher if she has any, and she shows them some prime cuts. Annie asks exactly where it was raised. The butcher scans a QR code on the beef tray with her smartphone and brings up a map showing exactly which farm in the Mendoza Valley the beef came from. Now, Luke happens to work in international logistics for a technology company, and he's intrigued. He asked the beef, he asked the butcher how the beef actually traveled from Argentina to La Eat. The butcher accommodates him by sharing a file from her smartphone app with Luke. It starts by telling him the number of the specific steer the steak came from and the date and time it was slaughtered. 
It then shows each step of the packaging and transportation process from the time the beef left the Mendoza Valley until it was delivered to eat this morning. It also validates that the beef was maintained at an optimal temperature between 33 and 37 degrees Fahrenheit at every step in the journey. Next, let Luke and Annie go to the grocery section to buy chimichurri sauce to marinate their flank steak, and they also pick out a few other items on their list. They stop by the cheese shop and learn that their favorite camembert is out of stock, but the cheese shop manager suggests they try a Pont Levesque, which they like very much and decide to buy instead. Finally, they go to the wine bar where they sample several wines they're considering to go with their appetizers, as well as some excellent Mendoza Valley Malbecs to complement the flank steak. They ask the robo host to also deliver the wines to their place the morning of the party. As they walk out of the store, the robo host gives them their total and asks again if the charges should be billed to their usual payment method. Luke remembers that he has an unusually high balance of points in one of his frequent flyer accounts and says he'll cover the cost from that. He authorizes the payment at the prevailing exchange rate with his thumbprint. He, uh, he no checkout lines, no cashiers. Luke and Annie walk home with the small bags they've decided to carry with them, having enjoyed their morning out together and even more excited about their upcoming dinner party. Meanwhile, while Luke and Annie are still walking home in Leet's corporate procurement and supply chain management department, Samantha is the director of vendor relations. She's just received a notification from Leet's dynamic sourcing system. It notifies her that the supply chain management system has updated dynamic sourcing with the information that the current supplier of camembert has been unable to fulfill orders for the past week. This is due to a production shortfall resulting from extreme weather conditions affecting their part of Normandy. It appears that the problems are likely to last for at least several more weeks. It also notifies her that the purchasing system has automatically canceled open orders with the current supplier while adjusting the amount due on open unpaid invoices from that supplier. It has slightly increased payment amounts owing to the fact that Leet will not achieve agreed volume discounts this quarter at the same time, it has deducted penalties due to late delivery and unfilled orders. The accounts payable system has already issued a final payment correctly reflecting all of these adjustments in compliance with their vendor agreement. What is it that's going to enable this level of innovation in both B2B and B2C e-commerce within the near future? Well, clearly a variety of technologies come into play in this particular situation. Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, 3D printing. We're already seeing with 3D printing the ability to print everything from the world's smallest lithium ion battery, which you can see perched on the tip of this pencil, to this 400 pound bioplastic cornerstone used for construction of a canal house in Amsterdam. In fact, General Electric is already 3D printing jet fuel nozzles from titanium. Yes, 3D printing is being used for much more than just items made out of plastic these days. And uh, because it's printed 3D with one part instead of 18, there's no weakest weld, and therefore it's five times as durable as the regular one, can be printed with gaps for cooling that also make it 25% lighter. This is going to have a huge impact on global logistics because it means transportation over time as more and more of our products are 3D printed at or close to the point of use or consumption will shift from finished products to raw materials. In many cases, retailers might start taking shipments of raw materials rather than finished products and manufacture custom-built orders on site for their customers. It could even impact global trade by reducing the need for import of finished materials. And if finished products can be 3D printed on site, they don't need to be assembled in those countries where labor costs are lower. Again, having impact on balance of trade because of fewer long hauls of finished products, lower volume could also be coming in through some of our ports. So there's a huge array of potential global economic impacts as a result of 3D printing. Intelligent agent technology 
also has a big impact. We're long familiar with the fact that in most organizations, the best performance is done by a handful of experts. The old 80-20 rule, the 20% of our best people handle 80% of our sales or order processing or business decisions of other types. Wouldn't it be great if you could take those 20% that are the best, most knowledgeable, most experienced people and have them look over the shoulders of the other 80% who are less knowledgeable and experienced to bring their performance up to that same level or as close to it as possible. The problem, of course, is you can't afford to do that because you can't take your best people off of doing their day-to-day -day job to coach the others. But with intelligent agent technology, you can provide input, assistant, and even assistance and even coaching to everybody so that the rest of the organization's performance curve shifts to a higher level if not quite matching that of the experts with many years experience coming much closer than they would otherwise much faster. And even the performance of the experts can be improved because intelligent agents technology will be able to free them up from some of the routine number crunching that otherwise is all too frequently required and takes time out of the judgment and experience uh, that these experts otherwise are able to apply. So you'll see AIs in the future uh, functioning so cleverly that they'll be able to do such things as schedule production based on maximum machine performance time and least impactful uh, changeovers, assign available staff with the greatest efficiency for those tasks, forecasting and optimizing material inventories, communicating with customers about orders and coordinating delivery and logistics, even predicting sales of products by identifying trends sooner than might be recognized by people who don't have time to continually analyze changing trends. So 3D printing, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, all are going to have a profound impact. And there's one more technology that's not typically quite as well understood yet but that's likely to have just as profound an impact as the rest of these. Just over 10 years ago, last fall, on October 31st of 2008, at the height of the global financial crisis, a paper was published on the internet by a person or perhaps a group of people, still as yet unidentified, but under the pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamoto. And that paper described how a unique combination of advanced cryptographic and synchronization technologies could enable for the first time the development of a digital currency viable as both a means of exchange and a store of value. The paper called this digital currency Bitcoin. And the underlying set of technologies quickly came to be referred to as blockchain. Now, because Bitcoin was the first killer app, if you will, for blockchain technology, people often conflate the two, assuming that they're essentially one and the same. It's very important to make the distinction that Bitcoin is simply one potential implementation of blockchain technology outside of hundreds that are already in place and thousands of more potential applications of the technology. To confuse Bitcoin with blockchain, would be a little bit like confusing email as the first killer app on the internet with all of the many other things that we do with internet technologies today, including, among other things, support blockchain technology. By three and a half years ago, seven years after the paper was published, things had evolved to the point where as conservative a publication as The Economist magazine stated that Blockchain was the most important advance in record keeping since the invention of the double entry bookkeeping system in Florence, Italy in 1494, more than 500 years earlier. So what is it that makes blockchain so powerful and so transformational to business, economy, and society as we move forward? Well, blockchains let us do four things that we couldn't do before and do them all well and simultaneously. First of all, it allows you to create a permanent, immutable, signed and time-stamped record of identity of people, places, or things 
ownership of assets, tangible or intangible, such as intellectual property, business transactions, or contractual commitments. It then allows those records to be shared among two or more entities, dozens, hundreds, thousands, in any particular business or social ecosystem. People, businesses, uh, interested and, and authorized third parties like auditors or regulators of various types, without having to depend on any one of those parties to be the master record keeper, and without having to spend to pay a third party intermediary to provide that service. For those so authorized, that information can be seen globally with complete transparency in near real time. And for those authorized to update that information, they can also do so. And yet at the same time, for those who are not authorized, the information on the blockchain is essentially unhackable. Now, as soon as I use the word unhackable, I see the hackles going up on the back of a few people's necks saying, well, Jack, given enough time and resources, any computer can be hacked, right? Yes, that's true. And that's why blockchain information is not stored on any computer. It's stored on many computers. Depending on the implementations, anywhere from dozens to hundreds to thousands of computers worldwide, having uh, all different kinds of environments, behind firewalls, on the clouds. And if you want to hack into a blockchain, you have to be able to hack in to a majority of those computers and change those records in the way that you choose to simultaneously in all these different environments. Because if you just hack into a few of them or one of them, the synchronization technology identifies that the information on this computer or this small group of computers doesn't match the consensus of what the rest of us have. Therefore, ignore it. It's invalid. Use only the valid information that's on the blockchain as a whole. And you'd have to be fast, because if you don't successfully hack into a majority of those computers before it synchronizes, which is anywhere from a few minutes on down to seconds or fractions of a second, you'd have to start all over again with the entire process. It's one thing to use the resources to eventually hack into a single computer, like the Target credit card database or the Equifax credit records database. It's entirely another thing to hack into hundreds or thousands of computers all over the world simultaneously and do it that quickly. In fact, uh, a physicist from Harvard estimated that for someone to successfully hack the oldest, largest, and slowest of the blockchain implementations, which is the Bitcoin blockchain, with 7,000 nodes around the world, the amount of energy that would be required to drive the amount of computing power that would be needed to simultaneously successfully hack a majority of all those nodes and complete that process before the next synchronization, which with the Bitcoin blockchain takes place every 10 minutes, would be approximately equal to the amount of energy emitted during the same period of time by the sun. Now, I know some of you are saying, so you could do it then. <laughs> well, yeah, theoretically, technically, it would be possible. But it becomes so wildly implausible, unlikely, that uh, people have come to recognize that it's, it's a waste of time to even go through the effort. If you're going to be uh, a cyber thief, there are far easier ways than by hacking blockchains. In fact, in a decade of use now, with trillions of dollars worth of transactions having been processed through the Bitcoin uh, blockchain, not a single penny has ever been lost from the Bitcoin blockchain. Now, those of you who follow Bitcoin may be saying, well, wait a minute, what's I've heard about these uh, people who've had their Bitcoin stolen, their Bitcoin lost? Well, some people keep their Bitcoin stored in online exchanges that are stored on single centralized computers that are subject to be hacking, to be hacked. And so consequently, if uh, you're so foolish as to leave large amounts of money for a long period of time in one of these online exchanges, you are exposing yourself. But the blockchain itself has never been hacked. That's the important difference. What uh, large investors in Bitcoin and digital currencies do is remove their currency or the passwords that control their currency altogether from those exchanges, store it in what are called uh, electronic or digital wallets, 
what's called cords, cold storage devices similar to a flash drive and actually take that flash drive down to the corner bank and put it in their safe deposit box. So, so much for Bitcoin replacing banks. <laughs> we'll at least need them to help us safely store our Bitcoin passwords in cold storage. Well, once people realized that blockchain technology could manage something uh, as valuable and fungible as digital currencies, they said, well, why not also use it for electronic medical records, giving us both the flexibility and security we need to protect our medical records and at the same time uh, make them available uh, to people that they do need available to. So your medical record is no longer controlled by your doctor's office or your hospital or your insurance company or even a big technology company like Facebook or Google or Amazon, but instead is controlled by you. You authorize your doctors to see that part of your medical record they need to see to diagnose and treat you, to update your medical record with the information about your treatments, and you authorize your insurance company to see the information about those treatments so that uh, the doctors can be reimbursed. Land titles. Cook County, Illinois, five million land titles, third largest such jurisdiction in the United States, is in a multi-year process of converting those land titles to uh, blockchain technology. How many people have bought or sold real estate in the last few years? Let me see your hands. Okay, what's the slowest part of the whole process? Waiting for the title search to get done, right? Take typically weeks, if not a month or more. In the future, we'll be able to do blockchain-based title searches in seconds, dramatically accelerating the ability to close real estate deals if we choose to do that. Why not 3D printing design files so you control the intellectual property so that when people download and print out an object, you can control exactly how many copies of that are printed out and the company that is responsible for designing that particular product or part or material uh, is properly reimbursed for the value of the intellectual property in it while reducing cost for both the customer and supplier, increasing value and productivity in the market. And for that matter, why not traditional purchase orders? By putting purchase orders on the blockchain and related routine business transactions, you have the opportunity to eliminate a lot of the leakage. Right now, when you have our traditional supply chain, we all know that we really have supply networks that are much comp more complex than a single dimensional supply chain. But if you go from supplier to manufacturer to distributor to carrier to retailer, each has their own siloed database of information. And even when the information is exchanged between those various different entities electronically, as it is in most cases today, there are still delays, errors, inaccuracies, information that falls through, doesn't get updated, is conveyed incorrectly for one reason or another. So we all invest huge amounts of time, energy, and money into reconciling the information in our database with those of our trading partners before we can take actions, order more product, pay for product, that sort of thing. Blockchain completely changes the way it works because from a logical implementation perspective, what you have is that all of the players in the system, in a particular ecosystem, see all of the relevant information that they are authorized to see as updated by any of the other players in real time. So multiple suppliers to a particular customer, for example, may all be authorized to see that customer's anticipated demand curve so that they can submit quotes and uh, gear up for production. At the same time, none of the suppliers are authorized to see the price quotes that their competitors are actually offering. By sharing, in effect, a single common pool of information across the ecosystem, we dramatically increase transparency of the supply chain and the ability to see and manage that information much more effectively. Now, one of the other excuse me, artifacts that you can store on a blockchain is what's called a smart contract. A smart contract is much more than just the digital version, uh, blockchain-based version of a traditional contract in, in word processing form. It's actually a computer program that 
runs on a blockchain and replicates the logic of the contractual relationship, can do such things as take custody over assets on a ledger, such as funds placed into short-term escrow in anticipation of completion of a business transaction, can track what has happened to date, such as identifying that the ordered product has been shipped and received in good condition, and then can take actions responding to that incoming information or events such as automatically generating the payment once confirmation of the properly ordered product or service is confirmed as having been delivered in good condition. Notice in that scenario what happened to the invoice. We, the invoices are not legal documents, but we have all these processes on both the sales and procurement sides of our business tied around invoices for payments. And yet it's not necessary and you can automate and eliminate much of the unnecessary human intervention in the process with smart contracts. As an example of this, a couple of years ago I had the privilege of keynoting the Global Big Data Conference in Qingdao, which is a port city on the northeast coast of China between Shanghai and Beijing. As it happens, I had been following for several months a proof of concept being developed and implemented testing the use of blockchain technology to facilitate international trade. It involved a shipment of cotton going from a seller in Houston, Texas to a buyer in China. Now, as those of you that are involved in international trade will know, currently today in international trade, even when you have enough trust to physically transfer possession of a product uh, from the uh, seller to the buyer, uh, by the time you formalize the transfer of ownership of that product, confirm and pay the appropriate import duties that might be required, uh, make sure that the uh, customer uh, is paying the uh, supplier the right amount for the product and is also paying the transportation carrier, the ocean freight carrier, in this case, the right amount for the product, uh, and those payments settle out and are finalized irrevocably, typically takes about 10 days. In this case, by an astounding coincidence, the product was shipped to and arrived at the port of Qingdao the very weekend before the conference I was speaking at. And so I was able to report at the conference that on receipt of that product, they scanned the barcodes on the pallets, verified that each pallet had what under visual inspection uh, was a, a cotton in good condition, and as soon as those barcodes were scanned, that information was uploaded to a smart contract which executed all of the relevant steps up to and including the transfers of payments. And all of this was finalized and settled out, not in 10 days, but in 10 minutes. Think about the impact of that on cash flow in international trade and accelerating and reducing the cost of international trade. Maersk, the giant, uh, 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 Danish shipping company has uh, already done a study that indicates that implementation of blockchain technology and in international trade will reduce the administrative costs of international trade by so much that it will reduce the overall shipping cost by 15%. People have a tendency to assume that the cost of shipping in international trade is all about the price of utilization of the, of the ships and, and the uh, fuel uh, for those ships and the people who drive them, in, and that's the majority of it. But 15 to 20 percent of that cost is administrative, and the vast majority of that cost could be dramatically reduced or eliminated with blockchain technologies. That cost reduction itself is anticipated to generate an increase in global economic product of some 5%. When it comes back to more on-hand back office operations of individual companies, in our current environment, as I said, we spend all this time reconciling our records to those of our trading partners. But in a blockchain environment, everything is matched up automatically. We're all looking at the same common pool of data in real time. And therefore, we reduce the need for time and effort and for post audits, for example. The auditing function in a blockchain environment is much more about advice on properly setting up and managing your systems than it is about pawing through old files of paperwork to make sure that the purchase order price matched what was charged on the invoice and what was paid via check. Another artifact you can store on blockchains are self-sovereign digital identity so that people, in addition to traditional information like name, address, date of birth, 
And documentary information like passport numbers, national ID cards, driver's licenses can also have their biometric information. <clears throat> Fingerprints, voice prints, retinal scans, facial scans stored so that you can uniquely tie that information in an immutable record under the control <clears throat> of each of us as individuals to our actual physical presence here on the planet. But it's not just for people, as valuable as that is, for managing business processes and for um, uh, eliminating or dramatically reducing uh, identity theft. It's just as applicable to things. The number of things on the internet in 2015 exceeded the number of people at 5 billion. By the end of the next decade, while some 7 billion out of then 8 billion people in the world are expected to have access to the internet, it's anticipated that a more than a trillion things will be communicating with the internet, through the internet. How are we ever gonna manage all the information coming from all those things? More importantly, how do we know that the information that purports to have come from a particular thing did come from that thing and wasn't accidentally altered at some point since it was created or actually was hacked and that thing was spoofed by some hacker with malintent or the information was changed in some way that would be beneficial for that particular hacker. Blockchain technology can help ensure the identity of the things that are creating this information and validate that they have been stored in immutable records so we can use our artificial intelligence to act on that information in near real time, knowing that both the source and accuracy of that information is correct. How many people remember the um, romaine scare that took place last fall? All the romaine lettuce was taken off of all the shelves in North America, okay? All right, is that because all of that romaine lettuce was infected with E. coli? No, of course not. Very tiny percentage. The problem, of course, was they didn't know which was. They didn't even know where the bad stuff came from. Well, as it happens over the last couple of years, Walmart has been involved in a proof of concept uh, to test blockchain technology to track the provenance of foods such as mangoes all the way back to the original source so they can find out where it came from and then for all of the product that came from that item, what retail locations it ended up being sold at or being delivered to. And what they learned at the beginning of the process was that on the average it took nearly a week to track this information down. With their blockchain system in place, they were able to do the same in two seconds which means that in the future, and they have now started requiring all of their suppliers all the way back through all the tiers, back to the original sources of food products worldwide to participate in this blockchain by the end of 2019. And um, that means that with this kind of technology, whether it is food or whether it is other products that are subject to possible problems or issues with parts or materials in some way, Blockchain technology can allow us to track the provenance. It's already being done, for example, with diamonds so that new brides don't have to worry if the beautiful diamond that their groom has just presented them with actually is a blood diamond. Managing provenance is powerful uh, capability for blockchain technology. So much more transparency in our records, uh, trust in our sources, even reduction of counterfeit goods for the same reason by tracking the origination and provenance of those goods through the entire blockchain. Now, some of you may be saying, well, I don't see how all this is going to happen in the next year or two, so what does it have to do with me? But one of my favorite quotes from Bill Gates is that we always overestimate the change that will happen in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. How many of you anticipate working or being in business for as long as 10 more years? Okay, good, most of you. How many think your businesses you work for will stay in business for 10 years? How many think your business is getting ready to go out of business in the next few months? Okay, good, because I was gonna say, if you do, what are you doing here? <laughs> I know, the French Quarter Festival this weekend. <laughs> okay, so my point is that 
Yes, we have to act in the short term, but we need to think in the long term. This is all very exciting stuff, but none of this matters unless you have a strategy for digital transformation. More specifically, blockchain-enabled digital transformation. It's not about force-fitting new technologies into your existing business model. It's about reimagining your business model and the entire business ecosystem. The idea is not to use blockchain, Internet of Things, AI, any of these other technologies, simply to make your current model marginally more efficient. Understand how these technologies affect your business processes, your business model, possibly even the design of the entire ecosystem as intermediary functions no longer become necessary, and then use any and all of these technologies as needed to implement that new vision. Blockchain does have a critical role in this process, though, because most of the rest of these emerging technologies are point solutions in the sense that they are applied at a particular geographical location or at a particular point within a given business process within an organization. Blockchain is different because blockchain provides the decentralized infrastructural glue to tie all of these points together, which means it can enable the digital transformation of not just individual processes, but entire enterprises and, in fact, business or social ecosystems as a whole. And we will be seeing those changes taking place. What is holding companies back from moving more quickly on blockchain adoption and, to a certain extent, some of these other technologies? Well, a study done a couple of years ago by Cognizant, the giant IT services company, showed that the major things that were the biggest roadblocks were understanding of blockchain and its use cases, communicating blockchain to key executive decision makers, evaluating the cost benefits of use cases. How many people here are confident that the full team of C-level executives in your firm has a good sound understanding of blockchain as we discussed it here this morning? Not too many yet. That's where you're going to have to get to. And that's why the digital transformation st timeline starts with awareness and communication. No, blockchain is not Bitcoin. Implementing blockchain technology to manage our business of more effectively doesn't mean telling our customers they have to pay us in Bitcoin. <laughs> but then an understanding and education, you've got to get deeper, even in a 45-minute presentation as to how can this be applied, not just the technical implementation, yes, the IT people will have to understand that, but that's the easy part. How can it be applied to help resolve business processes, improve them, then you develop your strategy and planning, then you'll be ready once you have a strategy in place. Where do we need to be two, three, five years from now? Now you can begin to roll out your implementation, your proofs of concept, extending it across the enterprise and working to help extend it across the ecosystem as a whole. It's a lot of change to manage. You gotta change your mindset, your business processes, your business model, even participate in changing your business ecosystem. But as the great historian Henry Steele Commager put it so uh, accurately over a century ago, while change itself does not necessarily assure progress, progress implacably requires change. I hope you'll make the changes in your organization and in your industries that help you take advantage of these technologies to survive and thrive in the evolving 20th century. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Scott, do we, we have time for a few questions? Okay, great. So who's got the first question? Scott's got the microphone here, ready to sprint across the room. Yes, sir. Hold on just a second. Um, kind of as a, as a case study, as I go back to my company and kind of explain some of this stuff, um, I know payment processing companies like PayPal and uh, Square are using blockchain, but what, what, would you say, what company would you say is a great one to look at that's leveraging this technology most? Uh, well, of course, uh, uh, Walmart's one exec, uh, example, um, and it's not just PayPal and Square. All of the leading financial institutions around the world are deeply involved with blockchain currently. They kind of got out front because they got freaked out that Bitcoin might replace 
uh, traditional fiat currencies, and by the time they realized that ultimately digital currencies will exist in parallel with more traditional payment forms, they'd learned enough about blockchain to realize that it could dramatically improve financial processes. For example, HBSC Bank out of China has processed over $350 billion worth of transactions on blockchain. Now, again, I'm not talking about payments with Bitcoin or digital currencies. I mean such things as letters of credit, for example. So I would look first in, at the leading edge to the financial services uh, industries. Um, uh, I mentioned Walmart. Uh, I will also say that what we have are a number of major industries, including some e-commerce uh, companies. Um, I'm drawing a blank on the exact correct name. Uh, Mercado Libre, I believe it is, in South America, is using blockchain technology to validate that e-commerce shipments have not been altered in any way uh, or fraudulently adjusted uh, by people, either hackers or even internal employees of companies, uh, of their company, so that you have an accurate record of what was ordered online, what was shipped, what was received. Um, so beyond that, you really need to take a look by industry. And there's many, many different industry blockchain consortiums. So if you have an interest in a particular industry, uh, just Google that industry, blockchain consortium uh, examples, and you will find dozens of examples all over the world. The, uh, last time I looked, there are some hundred. Now, most of them are not individually rising to broad levels of awareness across business as a whole just yet. But if you dig into the industries and markets that you draw on and, and are served, I think you'll find uh, a number of examples of uh, uh, implementations uh, uh, being done in the last year or two and proofs of concept under test and implementation uh, going forward uh, in the near term. Not everybody needs to run out and start doing blockchain by the end of 2019. But you'll put yourself in a very disadvantageous position if you don't have a soundly thought through strategy for how you're going to leverage blockchain, particularly in combination with some of these other technologies by the end of 2019, with an eye toward, again, where do you want to be in 2020, 2022, and beyond as you think about the strategic direction of your business? Excellent question. Thank you. Who's got the next question? Somebody back here, Scott? Um, yes, sir, this gentleman. Okay, we got somebody over here. Super. So first, thank you, Jack. You managed to freak me out this morning. With, uh, <laughs> Good. You're welcome. <laughs> we sit here talking about data and PIMS and e-commerce, and uh, and you are and we focus all of our efforts on that. And you're so far in the future of that, um, but. We are all mostly distributors in this room, so you showed that supply chain, and as much as we'd like to think we're the most important part of that <laughs> supply chain, what is our role? There's a lot of pieces that have to happen to build this. We have just one piece of that, and, uh, and we have manufacturers, we have Unilog as our technology partner that needs to enable this. Specific to distributors, what, other than being prepared, like you said, which certainly we can put things on paper, but what is our role in this, and, and how much of this can we drive, and how much of this will we follow? Well, it depends on the size of distributor you are and the markets that you're serving. So if you're a huge distributor like a, a, a McKesson in, in the healthcare products marketplace or a, uh, or a Granger in the industrial products marketplace, you can be driving as much as big manufacturers and, uh, and as huge retailers like the Walmarts uh, of the world. Uh, if you're small to mid-sized companies, uh, particularly as, as distributors, uh, I think that you need to emphasize where is it that you bring the most value? As you move toward blockchain, 3D printing, AI, and so forth, a lot of the traditional functions, if the only way you're providing value is because you've got a bunch of warehouses around the country in which product goes and sits for a while before it's shipped to some other location, that's not a very successful long-term solution for distributors. If, on the other hand, you're providing value by helping your customers and your markets better understand the options that are available to them in terms of products and services, parts, materials, sources, and so forth, find those right options. Help them understand the markets that you understand much better than they do and provide a combination of uh, education and consultative service in, additional, in addition to facilitating the transactions. In some cases, what we think of as distributors now may eventually evolve into organizations that are facilitating trade in their particular market 
with in many cases not necessarily taking physical possession of the product itself and managing the transportation logistics, but overseeing the process and unloading their customers' procurement and supply chain management functions from areas that they lack the knowledge and expertise to manage as well as you do. So I think it becomes much more of a knowledge kind of environment. Now, I'm not saying that warehouses and distribution logistics and transportation are going to go away. They're going to be around for a long time. But they're going to have to be very much more tightly integrated in with what your customers and markets on one hand are doing and what your suppliers are doing on the other side. And that's kind of the strategic direction I would look at evolving toward as you put together your plans and stay in touch. The communication piece is absolutely critical and you hit it absolutely correctly. You need to be talking to your manufacturers. You need to be talking uh, to your customers. What are you doing? Where are you going? If you're involved in a trade association, find out if there's any uh, activities there, any consortia that are already under uh, development in these areas. Um, and of course, continue to work with Unilog on what your requirements are going to be for them to be able to support the technical side of what you do. Excellent question. Next one. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, um, I've got a, it's kind of two parts. The answer to the first one will help me answer the, ask the second part. Okay. So, so blockchain is an implementation, I'm oh, sorry, um, Bitcoin is an implementation of blockchain. Correct. Um, cluster of people doing a thing. What, right. the, so first question, and you can answer them together, is what do you call these clusters? Is there a word that, that, that talks about the group? And then, then the second question is, how do these clusters form typically? Are they trade groups getting together, defining their whatever that cluster is? <laughs> or is it, is it leadership like uh, Walmart, driving, you mentioned large distributors or whatever. How do they typically form these clusters with data standards and all that kind of stuff? So Okay, the, the terms are still evolving, but what I hear used most commonly is blockchain networks. It's not a single blockchain. It's not all running on the Bitcoin blockchain. Five years ago, Bitcoin promoters thought everything would run on the Bitcoin blockchain. There's a lot of technical reasons why that's not going to happen. It's not been happening. Uh, generally, the blockchain implementations are set up independently. <clears throat> And much as 25 years ago, we had multiple different internets that are now all integrated into a single internet, people are working on the technical specs for making different blockchain implementations talk to each other where desirable or necessary. Um, the, uh, to get back to your question, how is it being driven? Is it by trade groups or is it by major uh, players driving it? And the answer is yes, both of those things are happening. Where you have markets where there are dominant, you know, op basically oligarchic markets, uh, the big players are often uh, pushing this ahead because they see the benefits to them. Uh, and if they're smart, they're communicating to the other players in the market the benefits. In other cases, trade groups are getting together where they recognize that this can take a lot of cost out of uh, processes and the ecosystem uh, while improving value to the end markets that those ecosystems are serving. So they're working uh, together uh, on developing standards, uh, business practices, what the processes need to be in place uh, to implement this. These things are evolving. Uh, in some cases, they're looking at the technical issues. Just as was the case with the internet, when I described in the banking scenario that 20 years ago, not all the technical pieces were in place to be able to do online banking. But within a few more months, within the next year or two, those went into place and people started taking advantage of them. We can't do everything with blockchain technology today that we'll be able to do, say, five years from now. But brilliant scientists and technical engineers that are working on evolving how blockchain works are solving those problems much faster than you can change your business models and business processes to take advantage of it. So that's not a valid excuse for failing to move ahead with beginning to develop your strategy in conjunction with your partners, both uh, upstream and downstream in supply chain, uh, and your technology partners like Unilog. One more yeah, question. Um, yes, sir. So, the boss. Uh, <laughs> um, one of the big blockers for any technology is the talent pool available for that technology to be widely adopted. Uh, what's the talent pool, uh, what's the current status of the talent pool within blockchain and where is it heading and who's leading the training development of this talent pool and what can we do as companies, technology companies to really help uh, move that forward because I think that's going to be a big uh, challenge for, that, for, that for scalability. That is absolutely an excellent question. And there are two, two pieces to the talent pool. 
Uh, one piece is the technical implementation people, the IT staff, the programmers, coders, architects, particularly the architects. Uh, it's few and far between. I know three years ago somebody estimated that there were 10 million Java programmers in the world and 5,000 blockchain architects in the world. That's a bit of an imbalance if you're going to make something work. Um, and that number is expanding co correctly. If you Google blockchain training, you will find at least 15 or 20 significant companies doing everything from online training to um, uh, webinars and that sort of thing, in-depth training, though, uh, to uh, in-person uh, training on the technical side of it. So that pool is growing rapidly. And I think identifying some of those companies uh, and potentially partnering with them uh, so that they can see that, yes, there is a demand for those services from technology companies as well as from end user organizations, technology departments, uh, will help them recognize the value of uh, conveying that, yes, if you take our courses, uh, there will be opportunities out there for uh, jobs that need to be filled. Uh, a bit more of a challenge is for the people who are working on the um, how to leverage these technologies for digitally transforming processes and business models within organizations as a whole. Some of the large uh, consulting businesses uh, like uh, uh, IBM, uh, Deloitte and some of the other big uh, big four consultants, uh, some of the big uh, Indian IT services companies, Cognizant and, and uh, Infosys and some of the others, Wipro, uh, are examples of companies that have a lot of the staff. Of course, they would like to sell it to you as services, but they've got lots of employees who could be potential uh, employees for other organizations at some point in the future. Uh, so it's a matter of part of your strategy does need to be to also look at your staffing issues, where you find those resources. Don't wait until you're ready to start coding next week to say, gee, where are we going to get a blockchain technician? Start thinking and planning ahead, whether it's training your own people uh, internally or going out and hiring new resources. I'm going to be able to stay around until the next session starts. I would be delighted to chat with any of you one on one. Let me suggest a couple of ideas. One. Join the Blockchain Executive LinkedIn Group, a discussion forum of several thousand senior level executives around the world on the strategic business implications of blockchain technology. Also, please feel free to reach out and connect with me on LinkedIn, and feel free to connect with me uh, via email or even a phone call if I can be of help to any of you personally. Thanks again. Have a great time in New Orleans. Laissez les bons temps rouler, as they say. Let the good times roll. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Incredible. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you so much.